Good afternoon. I uh, again uh, congratulate all the hardliners who are still awake on the uh, second day of the event. And I think my talk is going to be uh, really pretty simple to what I've heard today. So it's a true plumbing work talk today. So, so my disclosure is, I mean, this is, you can read that objective. My real disclosure is that when we talk about uh, alternative access for TAVI and the facilitated, my own personal disclosures, I have done a handful of trans auxiliary. I have done two uh, uh, aortic cable access and I have do, I've done two facilitated ones so that you know where I stand. So I'm going to share with you what is there and some of this I got from some of my colleagues so that we can understand, but I don't think it's very much difficult. So the learning objectives are to understand the indications and options, what options do we have, to demonstrate technique and limitation and pitfalls of alternative access, and understand how we achieve uh, homeostasis uh, and, and techniques for these alternative access. So, the definitions is when we talk about alternative access is an access other than femoral. And these options include either percutaneous or surgical. The percutaneous is axillary, transcaver, or quote unquote facilitated femoral. And other ones that require surgical uh, uh, expertise is a direct aortic, LV apical axis, or transcarotid axis. So do we have comparison where not everything is driven by data, it's only observation retro retrospective data, and it really depends on hard team decision, patient specific choice, and your local expertise, and should truly uh, dictate your access choice. So let's talk about direct aortic and transepical access as open surgical techniques, both decreasing generally to relative to non-thoracic. It represented in the US in 2019 about 17%. LV apical access was primary route for many transcatheter mitral, but even now this is migrating to transeptal. How about carotid access has become more common in the US, uh, about 20%. This is done mainly surgical and appears to have favorable risk profile in observational data, typically excluded if, if the contralateral carotid is also significantly diseased, which makes a lot of sense. The Axillary axis is you, you can do it either surgically or percutaneous is 56% takes a majority shareholder in, in the TABI across the United States in 2019. Potential signal for increased stroke in observational data, typically small caliber but less atherosclerotic than compared to the femorals. Some points about transcaval is percutaneous femoral vein crosses over the aorta. It allows largest sheath implantation to, would, without the requirements to have a limb salvage perfusion. And you close that by ADO plug devices and the venous hole should not. And the, according to the late, day, the late complication is not much after one year, but majority of your complication is within the hospital stay. The term facilitated Femoral axis is typically refers to vascular erythrotrepsy through an boba and stenting of iliofemoral vessels who, prior to advancing the large board um, devices. However, there's no comparative devices comparing to the other alternative axis, but it's intuitively thinks that it's a little bit simpler and maybe less complication associated with that. Now let's deep dive on the transaxillary axis, and I think we're just gonna go into quickly through the anatomy. So the, the three segments of the transaxillary axis should be recognized, segment one and two and three, and the area of which you should be aiming to is area number two, and we'll talk about why this is the area that should be um, the, the area of axis, and what are the important anatomical features of, of the axillary artery. It's about five to eight millimeters, could accommodate 12 to 24 French devices. Least likely to have atherosclerosis, Segment two, anterior aspect, this is your sweet spot. And this is, I think, importantly for us who are used to the fluoro as well. It's a fluoro marker with arm abducted. It's an inferior border of the glenoid cavity. May represent your lateral marker, which I'm gonna show you in an image uh, just after this. So this is how it looks like. So if you remember your shoulder anatomy, this, this is the, um, the, the glenoid fossa and you and this is which is your, your area that you should be like the second part of the transaxillary. So you get in from here 
and try to access your transactional access. So this is your inferior border of the, uh, but try not to access it lateral or to medial. So this is where segment two is. And why segment two? Because it, it does, it had, typically has absence of critical branches. You can potentially compress that and also you can decrease the risk of uh, brachial plexus injuries. And if you need to put in a cover stand, this is an area which you can put in because there's much less of the uh, flexion and extension areas. And again, looking at it uh, on an angiogram, and this is the inferior margin, and this is your sweet spot where you're gonna need to puncture under fluoroscopy or under uh, ultrasound guidance. And there are, I'm gonna show you some of the techniques how you do that. All right, so you need to screen them. You need to have your room set up and then access and closure. And typically left-sided may be preferred than the right because the angles may be more difficult from the right. And you, this is what we, uh, we're gonna talk about, how you access this, either open surgical access, which you get your surgeons do the cut down, expose the artery and access it. Or you can do it percutaneously. You take a GR catheter, you inject into the left side, you know where your landmarks are, you leave a safety wire down there and you puncture uh, according to your fluoroscopic um, uh, uh, reference. And that's where the wire is, you know where to do it and you just puncture it percutaneously, that's like what you do to transfemoral. You keep the safety wire down there and you, see, you can see where the puncture is at your sweet spot, which is right there. And then, and then the issue is how you're gonna close it. You do the, the um, dry field closure preferable, and I think I would, I would advocate that for everything, like what you do transfemoral, you pull it, you put the balloon there, and you put, your per, you per, you put in your per closes. And this is a courtesy from Dr. Jimmy McCabe, and actually this showed that you can, also at the segment two, you can compress it if there is some bleeding. So this vessel is compressible. Transcable, as I said, we have only done a couple of those. And CT is very, very important. You know the area which they come close to each other, below the renal artery, above the uh, distal aortic bifurcation, and try to find out which is the area. Sometimes you have a bowel between those, uh, the vena cava and the, and the aorta, and you know from the, uh, your CT which level is that, and you put that on, this, on your uh, CT when you're doing it in the cath lab. And then uh, you electrify, you put the GR4 guide there, you electrify it, you cross from the vein to the artery, you snare it, you put it up, you put your um, microcatheter in the aorta, you put a stiff wire such as Lunderquist or Ampla Super Stiff, and you go ahead with your sheath, And that's what we're talking about, the issues about the problems with the transcable axis. You have to be ready for that. And, and, and of course, the closure with the, with the ADO closure device. So carotid, I haven't done any carotid, so that's not my preference because maybe lack of exposure, lack of ergonomics, and, and, and also personal experience. You may require to have a vascular surgeon too if your CT surgeon is not comfortable doing those. But this is I got from actually um, from my, my friend from um, uh, University of Washington. They, they do percutaneous transcarotid. So they take the catheter, the, or the, they take a selective injection to the transcarotid and they do percutaneous axis. You can see that wire goes down. And they, what they also do, they put a um, swan balloon wedge catheter in the carotid, make sure, making sure the contralateral carotid is open just in case. It's like your poor man's just a protection device. And Tabby is done. And they close that with a per -close, closer device. And that's how it looks after that. So transfemoral facilitated, I think I'm not gonna go through the details because due to the lack of time, but it's very, very simple in principle. You cross, you cross it there, you put an um, peripheral IVL catheter. And the, the, the interesting thing is from the European registry, if you look at it with these um, 
hostile femoral artery is actually the the success the success rate was pretty high to to finish up your TAVR cases about 98 percent. Just I need two more minutes. And this is a case which we uh, describe about the uh, uh, utilizing the IVL in the, for the transfemoral axis. And you can see here vessels are too small and circumferential calcification. So we decided to go through the left femoral axis, we put in a 7 or uh, 60 millimeter shock wave, put the, uh, give, give the pulses, balloon it without any bailout stenting. Did the TAVR with 26 millimeter sapien, and then you do a final check and it looks pretty good. So I, if I summarize this um, talk, it, it's you need to utilize your CT to help you guide which alternative axis or a facilitated axis you want to use in your patient. If, and in my own preference, facilitated transfer axis has, has less target vessel disruption Kindly choose your access wisely, and last but not least, planning is everything. Thank you for listening.